lecturer from North Dakota. He's a published author, a great friend of Worldview Academy. He's been a guest speaker here every year for the last three years. And um, he's published, I think, seven books is what we counted just a little while ago. So he is far and above uh, the rest of us as far as that in that category right now. So please join me in welcoming tonight uh, Mr. Mark Bertrand. Thank you. I'm glad there's one category that I'm far and away above. And, and, uh, thanks for hedging it like that. I have to correct one thing that he just said. He said I was from North Dakota. Of course, we live in South Dakota, which is a completely different place and uh, much more populated. Much more populated. There's at least 50 of us. So, so this is called In Praise of Apathy. In Praise of Apathy. Because when everybody else is praising other virtues. I like to pick something that nobody has a good word for and see if there's anything good that can be said. So tonight, we're going to be talking about apathy, hopefully a little bit differently than you may have done in the past. But we'll begin by praying, just in case we need it. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we ask that you would use this time to draw us deeper into understanding, that you'd raise some interesting questions that uh, challenge us, that push us a little bit and give us something to think about it, chew on. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Um, I had an experience when I was in college that very few of you are going to be able to relate to. I had a professor who was always complaining about the younger generation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, she never pounded on tables or screamed at us or anything like that. <laughs> but, but she did let us know that she was disappointed in us. This was in the late 1980s and the early 90s. And she had been our age in the late 60s when everything got real. When people were suddenly switched on and, and were out there doing stuff in the streets and protesting and making change happen. And when she looked at us, we just didn't measure up. We were comfortable and complacent. And, and, and children who'd never really known difficulty, born you know, after war, we didn't even know what it was like. We were just raised in consumer culture so that when we did finally have a little bit of a war, none of us were even interested in going to Canada, which she couldn't understand. <laughs> and so she just let us know that compared to young people of her day, we didn't measure up. We were apathetic. We were apathetic, and that was a problem. And she's not the only one who thinks that. If you go around and ask people what's wrong with the world today, some of you have had to do this, you get a lot of answers. But underneath so many of those answers really is apathy. You know who Jane Goodall is? Yes. Anybody recognize that name, Jane Goodall? Um, who can tell me something about Jane Goodall? I just want to test and see if you really do know who I'm talking about. Yeah, you know the name. name. Okay, yeah. What's she famous for? Studying chimpanzees. Yeah, living with gorillas. <laughs> right? She lived with gorillas, and they taught her a lot about human beings. And one of the things she learned is what the greatest danger to our future is. And it turns out it's apathy. Apathy. You might have thought it was uh, failure to recycle or nuclear apocalypse or zombies, but no. It's apathy, the greatest danger to our future. And she's not alone. In 2011... Journalists for Human Rights, which is a group that was founded, um, kind of inspired by some United Nations work, they put together a writing prize called uh, Right the Wrong. Get it? But right with a W. Mm. Right the Wrong. And in 2011, the contest winner, the person who wrote the best essay of all the essays that were submitted about what's wrong with the world and what needs to be righted, she correctly fingered the problem as apathy. Apathy is the single largest problem we face today because it is apathy that fuels 
the vast number of social, political, economic, and environmental problems facing society. Apathy can be seen every day by people everywhere, just by going to school, by reading the newspaper, or listening to the news. It's everywhere. Do you agree? Have you seen it? Do people seem apathetic to you? You know what it's like to kind of look around and... <coughs> ah. <laughs> and, and it just seems like people aren't engaged or that they don't care. If you want a way to think about apathy and what apathy is, think about it as that, not caring. Just not caring. If, if uh, pathos has to do with the emotion, caring, to be apathetic is just not to care. And we're surrounded by people who just don't care. And that's the problem. Everything could be fixed. Everything would be better. Everything would be marching towards progress if only people cared. Or at least that's the idea. If apathy is the problem, then the solution is to make them care, right? So apathy is the largest problem we face, and apathy looks something like this. The way we spend most of our days staring at our screens, absorbed in a world that seems like a world to us, but actually we're not even aware of what's going on around us. Right? We have the, <coughs> the care sucked out of us. And do you see this everywhere you go? I'm shocked now when I go into public. It used to be we complained when uh, people sat in front of the television too much. You know, you're getting too much television now. My nephews come over and they sit on the couch next to each other playing video games on their own screens. And I, as an old person, want to take those away and say, look, watch television together. <laughs> it's a communal experience. <laughs> because it seems so apathetic, so withdrawn. Now, if this is the problem, if apathy is the problem, then what would the solution look like? How could we solve the problem of apathy? Um, if apathy is not caring, then the solution is to find a way to make people care about things. So the solution to apathy has got to be something like activism. Activism. Activism was a pretty specialist term when I was growing up. You didn't know anyone who was an activist. Uh, now it's pretty common. Activism is seen as a virtue, it's something we should all be doing if we care. And one of the goals of activism is to take people who are apathetic and turn them into people who care deeply about whatever it is that's important to care about. And if this happens, then the world changes. Then the world can be made better. Now you see this rising everywhere but you see it in particular in universities. I don't know if you follow the news, but I'm interested in seeing what's going on on university campuses. Um, the last time I was on a university campus as a student was in the, I guess, mid to late 1990s. And a lot of the things that happen now on university campuses happened then, but they were seen as extreme. Now they're a little bit more normal. Stuff I thought, only happened at my university because there were crazy people there, <laughs> now are, are like normal things. The way it seemed to me very extreme people thought then, now normal people think. And what it suggests is that the university isn't an aberration. It's not a place that because it's super liberal, everybody goes there to be crazy for a while and then they grow out of it. But rather it's more like a bellwether, like it's a way of seeing what the future looks like. I don't know if this was always the case, but I do believe it's the case now, that if we want to see the direction we're going in, we need to look at that example. And there's a reason why, because I think two things are converging there. On the one hand, you have, um, let's call it um, received wisdom. You get a bunch of very educated people together, professors together, teachers together. You get them in a place and they, they they give a kind of knowledge, they pass down a kind of knowledge, but they pass it to people at the university who are freed now from their childhoods, from the constraints that they had been placed under, free not just to learn, but to form identities. And those identities are formed kind of in an interlaced way, 
with the ideas that they're receiving. So that those kinds of educations are much more formative than what we've experienced in the past. Like the experience you have here at the Abbey is going to be more formative to your future than forms of education you've had before that were less intense or that you were experiencing at a time when you were less directly kind of under the lamp of influence, if that makes sense. So when you look at the universities today, you see a change in mission or change in focus. There's a, a social scientist, Jonathan Haidt, who wrote a book a few years ago called The Righteous Mind. Uh, some of you have heard me lecture on apologetics before, and I use a lot of his material to talk about why we believe what we believe and why we uh, defend it the way that we do. Recently, he wrote an article about what he calls the social justice university. What he's trying to explain is um, the way universities have changed recently from places where like, free expression and, and dialogue and debate are the norm to places where it seems as if that's changing a little bit. And, and a kind of, uh, let's call it an orthodoxy, is being enforced. And so the question he asks himself is why is this? So he wrote an article about it. I'm not going to share that with you. I want to share with you a comment on the article. So we're going to look at a comment on a comment on a trend in culture. This is uh, Alan Jacobs, who's a professor at Baylor and is somebody who I would recommend that you follow. He's a humanities guy who's for years has written really insightfully from a Christian perspective on literature and the arts, but also on society and general philosophy, all that kind of stuff. And he was trying to put his finger on why this shift. Because I think a lot of time, uh, like, so if I talk about social justice phenomena on university campuses, maybe you think of YouTube videos that, that have been posted to show how crazy college students are, that sort of thing. He's not interested in the phenomena as like a, a, a political one-upsmanship. He's not trying to show you how stupid people at college are. He's trying to understand why the shift has taken place. Like why people are behaving differently. And here's the, the, the point that I thought was really insightful. He said, the social justice faction in the university believes that the most fundamental questions about what justice is have already been answered and require no further reflection or investigation. And from this follows the belief that questioning the answers and still worse, suggesting other answers is, as Haidt says, a, a kind of blasphemy. You see what he's getting at? It used to be that you went to college to explore ideas. And in order to explore ideas, it helps to be able to be wrong. You need to be able to make arguments for things that you're wrong about and have those arguments demolished by better arguments. Have your facts challenged by other facts, right? So that you get a better picture. Out of that maelstrom, you form ideas that feel more true than what you went into. But that assumes that there's a question that still needs answering or there's a term that still needs a definition. Once you know, in this case, what justice is, talking about what justice is isn't what you're interested in doing. Once you know what justice is, it's time to do justice. <coughs> and it's frustrating. If you already know the answer, if you already know what justice looks like, and everybody else is still talking about what it is, it's kind of hard to be in the room. It's frustrating because these people seem apathetic. They're having this technical, academic conversation about abstract concepts when there's injustice in the world and it needs to be righted. So when you look at phenomena like this, uh, don't say to yourself, people have gone crazy. Ask yourself, why is the change happened? And I think this is right. I think the change has happened because the theoretical conversation for a lot of people is over. They don't, they're not questioning what social justice is. They're not questioning what should be done. They know what should be done. And they're ready to get it done, to do it. To move from apathy, not caring, to activism, which is caring in a very uh, forceful way. And I think that helps explain not just what's happening at universities, but also a larger dynamic in culture and in church. Because it's easy when you're sitting in church in the pews or the chairs, whatever it looks like, you're sitting there to tell yourself, wow, people are really going crazy out there. And all this activism stuff, it's a little frightening. 
And then you remember, oh, wait, we do that kind of thing too. Right? We know the definitions to things too. And we're done talking about things too and ready to start taking action. And so you see in Christian history a kind of activism as well. These are some, I don't know, they're the kind of protesters you'd like to have picketing outside your door. And their bowler hats and their, their waxed mustaches, not so bad. They probably don't burn up much when they protest. These are people who are advocating for huge, unthinkable social change, unimaginable social change. You know what they're protesting for? Yeah. My guess would be prohibition. Yeah, prohibition. We don't like drinking. We should pass a law so that nobody can drink. And we're done talking about it. We shouldn't talk about the evils of drink. We shouldn't preach about the evils of drink. We should shut down the gin joints and save America. And it worked. <laughs> Thank goodness they marched. <laughs> this kind of activism emerged out of a shift in the church, the emergence of something that, that we call the social gospel, where Christians, tired of talking about what the gospel is, talking about the kingdom to come, decided, why don't we do right right now? Why don't we change the world now? And when they looked at their culture, the worst thing they saw was the effects of drink. And so they went out and they changed it. They made the world better by marching. But in the process, they also lost touch with a lot. This is uh, Louis Burkhoff. He's a systematic theologian. And in describing Christianity of his day, he said, service is the great watchword of the day. And service only is the mark of true Christianity. There's little concern about the question whether this action springs from true religious principles. It is no wonder that the term activism is used to characterize American Christianity. To me, the most interesting thing about this quote is not the words on the screen, or at least not in the quote. It's, it's what you see down there, which is the year that this was published. It wasn't 2009, it wasn't 1969, it was 1939. 1939, the problem with the church is people don't care about doctrine anymore. They don't care if their principles are right. They just want to go out and do something, make change happen. They just want to be activists way back then, long before any of the stuff that we get so worked up about was even an issue. This was an issue much, much earlier than that. And I think it stems from that need to do something. We've got to do something, anything. We've got to make something happen. We can't just be apathetic. We've got to care. And depending on what you mean, I think that's true. That resonates. You know, I don't want people to be uncaring, but there are certain circumstances where I don't want people just to do something for the sake of doing it. It's not the way I want doctors to operate on me. I don't want doctors to operate on me at all. But uh, if they do, I'd like them to think first and make sure that what they're doing makes sense, that it's right. A lot of you think and maybe you know, have grown up in an age that's conditioned you to think that partisan gridlock is bad. But, but I look at the inability of the government to get things done and I think, wow, there's a comfort there. Like nobody can mess things up too badly if nobody can agree on what needs to be done. <coughs> maybe I'm pessimistic, but I can see some virtue even in apathy, like even in the unwillingness to do something until we really know what we're gonna do. The Hippocratic Oath that doctors take, the very first commitment that you make is what? Do no harm. Yeah, do no harm. Do no harm. It's not cut people open and see what you can do. It's like, this guy seems sick. We should, you know, take a look. It's like, be careful. Don't make things worse. Make sure you know what you're doing. The formula for my lectures that my wife has revealed to me is that they're never about the thing that I talk about for the first half hour. They're always actually about something else, and this is no exception. Um, the reason we're talking about this really isn't anything to do with social activism or signs of the times or the recent election or, or people going wild on social media. It's about something deeper. Forces, I think, that drive all of those phenomena, but are much older 
than that. And I think that, that opposition between caring and not caring, between thinking things through or doing something at any cost, it's really the conflict between uh, the head and the heart. The conflict between the head and the heart. Which one are you going to choose? Are you going to follow your head? Are you going to follow your heart? Or if, like me, uh, are you going to ask, is there a third option? The purple one. Is there a third option? <laughs> Depending on what frustrates you, if you're a really sort of rational, intellectual person, you probably just wish people would think a little harder. If you're a more passionate, emotional person, you're probably really frustrated by people who just don't feel what the right thing is, and as a consequence, don't do it. So all of us feel as if the other side are living in a false reality, and we wish they would wake up and either stop screwing things up when you don't understand them, or start doing something instead of just sitting there and talking about it. I want to ask if there's a third option if maybe both of those things are wrong and we need to discover something else, the third pill, so to speak. Um, to do that, I need to reveal a little bit of my deception because I'm not here to praise apathy. I'm not here to praise apathy. The, the concept that I want to talk about really isn't apathy, it is apatheia. Apatheia was a concept that belonged to a, a, a Greek philosophical movement called Stoicism. Although I doubt Stoics ever really had anything to call a movement. They weren't big on movements. Stoics were not the guys that made things happen in the world. They were the guys who looked at the world and said, you know what? We have no power to change this, but we do have the power to change ourselves. And so when you read Stoic philosophy, Stoic philosophy is like as close as you can get in the ancient world to a volcanism. Right? Not the volcano type. I'm talking, obviously, Mr. Spock. Um, these are guys who are trying very hard to be super rational. More importantly, not to be ruled by their passions. Not to be ruled by their passions. Because as Greek thinkers, they understand the world in a very special way. It has sort of an upper story and a lower story. The lower story, if you're talking about uh, you know, the things you see in the external world, there's the physical and then there's the spiritual. And the physical is evil, the physical is bad. And you wanna transcend the physical in order to get to the spiritual. That's a highly influential worldview, even in Christianity. Right? As Christians, we often think that way. The body is evil. The spirit is good. To be spiritual is to be disembodied. We aspire to a, an eternal future that we imagine would be disembodied, where we float on the clouds or something like that. That's not a Christian idea. It's a Greek idea. And the Greek mindset, the Platonist mindset, is sometimes we describe it as the hidden worldview. It is the worldview that has shaped the Western world more profoundly, perhaps, than any other including Christianity, and yet most of us are completely unaware of its influence and don't realize when the ideas that we are speaking are Platonist or Greek or Hellenistic ideas. This is just one of them. But it reflects that, that tension between the upper and the lower, not in the external world, but, but in the person. Because the Greeks look at human beings and they see the intellect and they see the passions. Passions are the things of the body, are the things that, that drag us down, and we must master them. The intellect must be superior. The mind must rule the body and suppress its, its instincts, which are corrupt. You can see why, to early Christians, that was an appealing concept, because in certain ways it does seem to dovetail with ideas that you find in Scripture. Right? The idea of the, the corruption of the flesh, the flesh at war with the spirit, that sort of thing, you could easily make that leap. So the Stoics believed that the path to wisdom was to live in such a way that your mind ruled, that you weren't driven by your passions, by your emotions. You weren't angry all the time. You weren't uh, sad all the time. You weren't sort of blown back and forth by the winds of the emotions, but instead were steady. You had equanimity. You were 
unmovable by things. The world couldn't shake you because you understood the world was movable itself. You expected that. You expected things to be bad, and you made allowances for it. Perhaps the most famous Stoic is this guy. That's uh, Marcus Aurelius, the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, whose meditations are probably the most widely read, at least you know, today, uh, the most widely read epistle on Stoicism. But these ideas, as I said, they, they took hold in Christianity as well. And so you see what we might think of as Christian Stoics. And you look at early Christian mystics, uh, monastics. They wanted to get away from the, this civilized world with all of its temptations, to go out into the deserts and isolate themselves. This is Simeon Stylites, who lived on top of a pillar. I was suggesting to Huck that while Mr. Baldwin is out of town this weekend, we build a pillar in his backyard that he can climb onto and live on. <laughs> and uh, you'd think he'd be mad. I think he'd be pleased <laughs> to have a pillar that he could live on. Um, these early Christians, Stoicism, the virtue of apatheia, it appealed to them because they too believed the passions were not their friends, that the passions would overturn them, that if they, they gave in to their hearts, they would be led astray. It was important that the mind rule the body. You see this throughout intellectual history, human intellectual history, this, this conflict between the intellect on the one hand and feeling on the other. Intellect over here, this is represented by a famous etching of Goya's. Does anybody know the name of this? If you read Spanish, this is going to be a lot easier than if you don't. Yeah? I'm assuming it's Pandora's box. It's not. Good guess, though. Any other attempts? It's called The Sleep of Reason Breeds Monsters. The Sleep of Reason Breeds Monsters. <coughs> you get the idea. When reason goes away, when we're no longer governed by the intellect, what results is terrible. Now, Goya's idea of terrible looks like owls and cats to me. <laughs> but these apparently would be considered really fearsome beasts in the time that they were etched. And it, it captures an idea that I think emerges, uh, it's not, it doesn't originate, but it's very strong in the Enlightenment, that the thing that prevents the irrational, our terrors, from taking hold and destroying everything is, is the rule, the government of the intellect. If we can all just be reasonable, if we can all just apply logic, everything will be okay. And in the Enlightenment, that made a lot of sense. But of course, Enlightenment people procreated and had children, and those people became the Romantics. <laughs> they didn't like the Enlightenment rationalism of their parents, and instead they went out into nature to feel things. In England, they went into pastoral scenes and they felt cute things. But in Germany, they went up into the Alps and they felt big things, uh, Sturm und Drang, the storm of emotions that was suddenly unleashed. And it swept away that, that thin veneer of rationalism and got in touch with what was really human, the heart, the passions. Those were the things that needed to be unleashed because that was what was authentic. That conflict, that conflict is also Greek. Thanks, Greeks. Um, Friedrich Nietzsche, in one of his early books, The Birth of Tragedy, writes about this tension that he sees in early Greek drama and culture, and a tension that continues to our day, and he uses two Greek gods to personify it, Apollo and Dionysius. That Apollo is the god of reason, He's wise, he's intellectual, he is over the, the sort of mathematical arts. Like if you're a musician, that's a lot of math, notes and stuff, if you actually know how to read music. Um, he's your guy. Dionysius, uh, the Romans called him Bacchus, he's the guy you get drunk with on the weekends. <laughs> Dionysius is everything that's sort of earthy and, 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 I don't know, sort of subversive about humanity. Dionysius, he likes to have fun. He doesn't like the company of Apollo. Apollo cannot stand his company. These two gods represent two 
rules, two reigns, two primacies. One, the primacy of the intellect. The other, the primacy of the heart. And the question is, who will reign? Who will reign? In Christianity, we've kind of gone back and forth. And you can look at, at the history of the church, and you'll see periods in the church where we've been very intellectual. We've been very rational. You can also see periods where we've been a little bit more emotional, a little bit more uh, feeling. And it's strange, but you can d identify like real periods, and they often follow, like enlightenment theology tends to be very enlightened. Romantic era theology tends to be very feely. Right? It follows in that way, as, as you may see the crown is passed back and forth as we argue over what is a human being? What should govern a human being? Ought we to be governed by our minds, or should we be governed by our passions. To a lot of us, because of our disposition, the answer should be obvious. You're like, I, we don't need to talk about this. It's, it's so clear. It should be, but it's not going to be the same answer for everyone. It's so painfully obvious the intellect should rule and reign that let's just end here. But then others will say, no, we need to feel. It's so obvious that we should lead with our hearts and follow our hearts. You can tell the way I just said that where my sympathies are, right? I'm not hiding this very well. Like, I'm definitely one of those people that, that when I read about apatheia and the Stoics, I think those guys were on to something, <laughs> right? They could really solve a lot of the problems we have today, but I'm not right about that. And there's something wrong with, with my certainty, and there's something wrong with yours. We need to ask ourselves one simple question from a biblical point of view, which is, what is a human being? What is a human being? When we think about this question, we do tend to answer along these predetermined lines. Some of us want to say we're rational creatures. Right? We're meant to be reasonable. And it's only because of sin that people are illogical. Not me so much, but a lot of the people I know. <laughs> you know, and then... We look at these cold, unfeeling, rationalistic people who seem blind to what's going on around them, and, and we just think, wow, I mean, it, it's almost inhuman the way they are. It seems so obvious. It's got to be one or the other. But maybe it doesn't. Where could we go to learn what a human being should be? Where could we go to learn what a human being ought to be like? Hmm? Um. Sunday school answer, but the Bible. Being we can go to the Bible. Yeah, good Sunday school answer. Uh, even more specific than that, though, there's like a specific place in the Bible. Yeah? The creation account, when man first is created. Yeah, we could look at that. What were Adam and Eve like in the garden? We could go there. But I want a better example than that. Jesus? Yeah. Couldn't we go to Jesus? Like, if we want to see what humanity should be like without the taint of sin, wouldn't Jesus be good to look at? And of course, when we look at the life of Jesus, we see a man whose intellect governed everything else. A man who had his passions in control. A man who, frankly, never felt a feeling in his life because he was a perfect human being. Maybe not. You read the accounts of Jesus in the Gospel, it's surprising the man could feel there's an essay I want to recommend to you by B.B. Warfield with the most unlikely title of anything you'd ever encounter in a seminary classroom. It's called On the Emotional Life of Our Lord. I don't know if you've spent a lot of time thinking about Jesus' feelings, but Warfield did, and he noticed something really interesting, that what's going on in Jesus is not what we tend to think is meant to be going on in human beings. He says, Jesus manifests the strongest emotions of love and of wrath, and yet exhibits a perfect symmetry between all aspects of his being, not because his intellect constantly knows how to keep his passions in check, but because in the sinless one, the strongest emotions are naturally such as accord with the holy will of God. So what you see in the life of Jesus, yeah, there's intellect, but there's also passion, and you don't see one governing the other. You see something else, something uh, polar, 
with more unity to it. Where we've gone into our nature and sliced and diced and tried to find out what is the part of us that makes us us, it turns out maybe like all of us makes us us. Which might explain why God made us as we are. So when you ask what should rule the head of the heart, maybe the answer is that none are fit to rule. And that's the third pill. That neither should rule. That the intellect shouldn't rule over the passions, nor should the passions rule over the intellect, nor are human beings just intellect added to passions. But something more than that, much more than that, that has to live as it was made in a whole, in a unity. You're not wrong to feel, and you're not wrong to think you should do both of those things, and do them better than you do. Not suppress one in favor of the other. Both of those things are part of what it means to be fully human. This is uh, from Cornelius Van Til's Introduction to Systematic Theology. I like it because this reminds me of how wrong I am in my tendencies. It reminds me that the intellect is no better than the emotions. He says, the emotions or affections are not inherently unruly. They have become unruly only because of sin. But when sin has entered into the mind of man, the intellect is as unruly as are the affections. The mind doesn't get a pass because it's logical. The mind is just as unruly as the affections are. In that case, the whole man refuses to subject itself to the rule of God. So we are commended not indeed to eradicate our affections, seeking after the inhuman apatheia, commended by the Stoics, but to correct and subdue that obstinacy <coughs> which pervades them on account of the sin of Adam. Another way of saying this, I guess, would be that the effect of sin affects the whole man. It's all fallen. It's not that because of sin the passions got out of order, and now it's up to reason to rein them back in. Everything got unruly as a result of sin, and all of it is in need of restoration that can only come from the outside. You don't have something in you that if it could only be fed enough, if it could only be favored enough, could restore order in your disordered self. So the third pill, just to make it obvious, is this. It's not the primacy of the intellect or the primacy of the heart. It is the submission of the whole person. We shouldn't look for a ruler in our heads or a ruler in our hearts. Instead, we should try to submit our whole selves to the rule of Christ. Another way of thinking about it, we'll end with this is that what's going on in our lives is an act of restoration. What grace is doing to us is restoring the order that was lost as a result of sin. That means grace will restore the intellect. Grace will restore the passions, the emotions, and make us into the whole people that we're meant to be. None of us are there. But this is part of the promise that God makes to us, he will restore to us our whole humanity. So, when you're tempted to think that the choices that face you are either to, to march in the streets or sit on the couch and play video games, it turns out you might find yourself doing both of those things at different points in your life, and for good reason. <coughs> Maybe not for good reason on the video games, but you see what I'm getting at. Right, that that's a false dichotomy. Right, there are things you will not care about because you shouldn't, and things you will care deeply about because you must. But it's not a question of following your head or following your heart. It is a question of following Christ with your whole self. Let's pray. Father, you know us in our weakness, you know us in our brokenness, and you know that we try to restore ourselves by elevating some fallen part of us to rule and reign over all the rest. We do it in our world and we do it in our lives. We ask, Lord, that instead of these uh, false kings, that you would dethrone them all and instead install yourself to rule over us, to rule over our minds, to rule over our passions, 
to make us the fully human people that you intend us to be. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.